All right. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, open with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right on into it. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That's why we'll rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, We thank you for your word, for the gift of the written sword of the Spirit, uh, for the word of the the blood of the Lamb and the word of the the saints, the testimony of the saints. Uh, Lord, we thank you that this is not just some small group of people with a crazy idea somewhere, but we're joining in with a great multitude Folks who have followed you, who have been uh, having a heart after your own heart for centuries, for millennia. And so we appreciate the privilege and we, uh, we acknowledge that this morning, what a privilege it is to join with the great multitude uh, through the ages uh, for the purpose of glorifying you and honoring you and to spend a little bit of time diving into your holy scriptures. Uh, may your words be spoken this morning. May they be anointed and and fall as they need to. We love you. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in week two of four on our How to Read and Understand the Bible (laughs) mini-series. And as I explained last week, it was originally condensed down to a six-week overview, very high level. And then we condensed it even further to four weeks. So we're we're going very high level, and we're kind of touching briefly on a lot of different concepts. We're not diving super deep into anything in particular. Uh, Part of the hope on this high-level overview is to get a little bit of an appreciation for maybe what are some of the elements of approaching the scriptures that we don't normally think of or that we don't normally hear taught about or preached about per se. Um, So we started last week with kind of the introduction, and we outlined two problems, the one that I wrote down on the notes and then the other one that I spoke in the class, which was uh, the short summary. I would say the problem is that we are in an unprecedented era and age of Bible poverty, and it's uniquely different from uh, history in the sense that ours is not a poverty that comes from an inaccessibility of the word, but rather an indifference that's been growing and developing uh, to the word. Uh, to me, that's a little bit more terrifying than <laughs> simply an inaccessibility. Right. And we, uh, I had referenced a survey, a poll that I had heard recently that I very much hope is incorrect, uh, because if it is correct, then it's very terrifying indeed, that says uh, in the modern church, only about 10% of Christians are in the Bible at least once per week. And I just thought that was frightening. So I hope it's incorrect. I hope that's very low uh, on the projection. And so we spend a little bit of time, and you do have the handouts, of course, that now you can reference, which is helpful. Uh, but we, we looked at a few starting points of how do we, how do we even approach the Scripture? How, how do we view it and, and understand it a little bit? And so we kind of looked at some Scripture passages that outlined uh, from itself how Scripture speaks about Scripture. That one, it is God-breathed. Um, everything that came about was the Lord inspiring various prophets and various authors and, and penmans, if you will. Uh, but it wasn't just the crazy ideas of you know, individual peoples. Uh, but also scripture is beautiful. And we look through a lot of the Psalms and how they, uh, you know, David and some of the other psalmists referred to it as uh, the law of the Lord is beautiful and pleasing and nourishing to the soul. And from Ezekiel, like it's honey, you, know, you taste it and it's sweet and nourishing. And then also, Scripture is insightful and practical. And, of course, we used classically some Proverbs because there's a lot of practical insight there. Uh, Again, some references from Psalms and even from Romans get into the New Testament. And we really camped out for the rest of last week in an illustration that I found to be very good, uh, which I call the hand illustration. I call it. Somebody else called it that. I used it. (laughs) And I was waving around a sword all the last session, so we'll make sure to get the video posted so you can appreciate that. Um, But it's talking about when you're wielding the sword, and of course the sword of the spirit is the analogy, and I intentionally brought in a sword that was fairly heavy um, so that the analogy would work the way it's supposed to. But you've got five fingers, and each one of them represents one of the disciplines in how we approach scripture and wield it to be effective as a swordsman. So we started with the pinky, which is to hear the word, and that's going to be things like listening to an audio Bible, that's going to be listening to sermons, Sunday school classes. Uh, The ring finger is to read the word, and so I think of that as more like devotional, kind of, hey, I'm reading through it, what jumps out the page at me? How does it 
How does it resonate with my spirit today? Um, the third one is to study the scriptures, and that's where you get to the middle finger. And, it, and when I was doing this with the sword, I was holding it with one finger, like, okay, that's not a very strong grip. Okay, now two, it doesn't feel like it's going to fall, but it doesn't really have any strength. I wouldn't wield this in a battle. By three, you're starting to get at least a decent grip of it, but it's still, you're not very effective all, all around. So the study of the word is when we get into things like understanding context and trying to figure out, okay, what is, what is the passage I'm reading? Where does that fall in the timeline of Israel's history or of world history or whatever it is? Uh, and then starting to figure out kind of what was really meant in the original passages. So that's your study element. Uh, the fourth one is one that we have all learned in Sunday school growing up, but we kind of get away from it because life gets busy, and that is memorization. And that comes out of Psalm 119, and it's a brilliant, it starts with a question, but then an answer. It says, how can a person keep their way pure? By keeping it according to the word of the Lord. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So it's not this promise that we never will, that we're never going to be uh, stumbling in life, but it's, it gives us access to the, the truth of the scripture that we can speak into our situations, that the spirit can remind us of. Uh, when we face temptation. So it gives us the power that we might not sin. And then lastly, the thumb, the one that kind of holds everything together and gives us that final strength over the, uh, the grasp of the sword of the spirit is to meditate on the word. And we use meditation in the sense of like reflecting and thinking about, not necessarily in the, you know, ohms and, you know, Middle Eastern or whatever, <laughs> Far Eastern, um, but thinking about it. And it goes really hand in hand with memorizing because as you memorize the word, and then you're going about your day, you're starting to think about what are the words that I've memorized. And you're, you're not just committing them to memory, but you're kind of committing them to soul, to spirit. It's, it's sinking deep and allowing it to actually affect your being. Um, so I love that hand analogy. And it's, uh, if you want a more deep explanation, then once we get the videos posted, you can go back and look at that. And then we briefly touched on the second handout. We didn't get through all of it from a time perspective. Um, but we wanted to just kind of do a high-level overview of how is the Bible organized. Because you may have read through it. If you're like me, I probably read it cover to cover about half a dozen times before I got this question in my mind. Like, something is not lining up chronologically here. Like, I'm reading this, and then it, like, jumps, and then it jumps, and it moves around. And I just remember being so confused for, for a long time until I realized, oh, the Bible's not organized simply chronologically. Right. It's organized by type of literature. So you've got, you know, you've got Torah, you've got historical books, poetry, major prophets, minor prophets. Same thing in the New Testament. You've got the Gospels, which I call, basically I refer to those as theological narrative. So it's historical, but there's also the unpacking of theology and philosophy at the same time. Versus Acts, which is just almost exclusively historical. And then you've got the epistles, and lastly, uh, prophecy through Revelation. And so just understanding the type of literature that we're reading can influence the way that we view a particular passage. So, for example, if you get into the middle of Ecclesiastes and you're like, I just don't see how this, you know, lines in my historical critical analysis of the scriptures. Well, it's because it's not a historical critical passage. You need to assess it through the lens of poetry. What is poetry meant to do? How are we meant to apply it to our lives? Uh, so that can help clear up a lot of the questions that we have when we approach the scriptures. Um, the other things that are on that first handout, or excuse me, that second handout from last week, uh, are things that we didn't touch on from time's sake, and we may have time today to pick up on those, depending on how efficiently we move through the rest of it. Uh, and so I'm going to keep that handy just in case. The good thing is a lot of these are things that I've read and studied and thought about a lot, so I can go off of my notes pretty quickly <laughs> and expound probably more uh, comprehensively than we might want. Uh, so we're going to jump into today, which is week two of four. And today we're actually looking at the Bible as a work of communication. Um, so what's the problem for today that we're going to address? Well, the, the, the high-level problem is many parts of the Bible can be difficult to read, difficult to understand, and also difficult to apply. Beyond that, many passages are simply confusing or seem to be giving conflicting information. All right, so high level, communication, what is it? 
I looked up a whole lot of different definitions and I liked elements of some of them, but not any of them in their entirety. So I made up my own, uh, which you see on the sheet there. So I said, very simply, communication is the process of giving, receiving, and then processing or understanding information. So I think that captures all the major elements and just condenses it into a, a short sentence. Uh, so why do we speak about the Bible as communication? Um, well, because in my opinion, it is. Uh, whether you're speaking to somebody, whether you're writing to somebody, whether you're creating an artistic display through painting, through music, uh, through hand gestures, uh, eye contact, all these different things, all of these fit into that category of giving and or receiving and then processing information. So under that general description, we could see that all of scripture is communication in some degree or another. And that leads us to our fancy words that we've got up on the board here <laughs> from a Latin class. Uh, now this comes, it's, there's a lot of different theories about communication, how they summarize it. This is a really simple one that I like a lot. I feel like it captures everything pretty well. Uh, so this is called speech act theory, and if you want to know who came up with it, I can go look it up. I have it written down somewhere, but I didn't put it on the sheets today. <laughs> um, so there's three essential elements to any communication. There's the locutionary element, the illocutionary element, and then the perlocutionary element. And I went ahead and I gave you, I didn't even make you fill in blanks today. I just wrote out the definitions of them. And the, uh, the locutionary is... The message, the information, the communication itself. And so that could refer to a spoken communication. That could be a written uh, or a painted or, or kind of like we were saying before, it could be music. I even put in there aromas, you know, our different senses being engaged. We're receiving and processing information. Uh, and then even body language and, and other kind of nonverbal and tactile. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's the locutionary element. Then there's the illocutionary element, which is the originally intended message from the sender. So what did they mean in their mind when they gave the communication? And you could probably imagine that the perlocutionary then is what was the message that was actually received uh, by the recipient. And it's amazing how many times those can be different. <laughs> Um, I actually had written a blog post that gives a pretty good explanation or a good uh, illustration of this. Um, and I, I was going to just go off it with bullet points, but I actually liked how I wrote it, so I'm just going to read this to you. Uh, this one was in particular uh, referencing the voice of God and how do we hear God speak in prayer. Um, and so I opened up with the same three things, the locutionary and so forth. And after that, I say, one of the reasons I like this simple model is that it draws our attention to our obvious miscommunication proclivities, <laughs> our tendency to miscommunicate. Like it or not, the messages we convey are not always the same messages that are received. And we can appreciate this to an extent because we know that my own worldview, my own experiences, my own thoughts, and even my own personality are uniquely different from yours. And so it follows reasonably that each word or expression or idea will mean something a little different to each of us. Even if every other factor is static and unchanging, the very fact that we are dynamic and ever-changing lends to a world of varied perceptions and interpretations. And I actually just finished last week uh, posting a, a podcast where I talked, uh, going on the podcast we're going chronologically through the New Testament, so I'm trying to touch that element as well. And we're really far. We're all the way up to Matthew 2, so. <laughs> which is the Magi and following the star of Christ and to Bethlehem and all that. And one of the things that was interesting is going through the astronomical phenomenons. And one of the concepts that, that we see, there's a few weird things that happen, especially with planets, uh, which the original word for planets is uh, moving stars or wandering stars. And planet is just a Greek word that effectively means to wander. So there you go. If nothing else, you got a fun little word. <laughs> uh, but why they call them wandering stars is every, every true star that we can see in the night sky is fixed in its position. It moves through the sky because of our orbit, because of the way that we're rotating. 
but also the, uh, the wandering stars, the planets, they seem to behave a little bit oddly at times. Sometimes they, they move like other stars, and then sometimes they'll basically just like stop in the sky for a while. And then sometimes they'll do what's called retrograde. They'll go back and like circle and then kind of resume their original trajectory in the sky. And all of that comes down to the fact that we are not on a static fixed point, that we're moving, we're dynamic, and also these other planets are moving and they're dynamic. And so the way that we see what's happening in the sky is influenced by all of that. And I liked that that was just this past week. I'm like, that plays in perfectly to what we're talking about here, you know, that we are not static. We are also dynamic and changing. But when we're applying these concepts, and this particular blog was about prayer, so I said when we're applying these concepts to prayer, the illocutionary and the perlocutionary elements, believe it or not, are actually the easy part. What do I mean in prayer? How do I think God receives it? And vice versa, what does God mean? And how do I receive it? Where it truly gets interesting is when we actually begin to examine the locutionary element, which is the communication itself. So there's an old flawed expression that I heard a lot growing up, but I don't know if people say it anymore, but they used to say, the medium can change, but the message stays the same. Preston Sprinkle wrote a book called Flickering Pixels, and he presented a compelling evidence that the medium, the method of our communications, actually changes the message itself, as well as the way that we receive it. To use a simple illustration, a person might ask a simple question. What is coffee? Other than just saying a little slice of heaven, <laughs> I might respond with a description of coffee, or I might explain its history and the various harvesting and brewing methods. But I could instead answer by showing a handful of coffee beans, or even a cup of brewed coffee. And this visual would create a different perlocutionary reception. Alternatively, I could encourage the asker to listen to the sound of coffee being poured into a cup, the sound of coffee beans being ground. Perhaps they could even smell the coffee or taste the coffee. And every one of these would be valid answers to the original question of what is coffee. But the medium, in each case, has changed the perlocutionary element, the answer that is received. And so it's similar when we pray, and specifically in our times of listening to the Holy Spirit, it's helpful for us to remember that God often communicates with us in unique and interesting ways when we're not careful or attentive, or heaven forbid, we're stubborn. Personal testimony. <laughs> uh, we can miss out on something beautiful, wondrous, significant. It's kind of like how music can move us and connect with us in a way that's different from words. A song in a minor key can make us feel sad. Um, a major key can make us feel happy or, or like there's resolution. The voice of God in prayer is the voice of spirit, of heart and soul. It's the resonance of truth, the wonder of beauty, and the warmth of love. And so it is different, but it's no less real or significant than the words we speak with others. We can, of course, also use words in our conversations with God, and sometimes he uses words with us, and mostly through the word. But much of the time, it's more of a joining of our spirit with the spirit of God and with utterances too deep for words. So that was specifically related to prayer, but again, I think it gives a good illustration of how the locutionary, the medium of our message, can change the way that we understand or receive the message, and vice versa, the messages we give to others uh, oftentimes what they receive is heavily, if not completely influenced by the way that it is presented. So that's our Latin words. I'll keep them up there for now. Uh, shout out to Flipping Pixels. We already touched on that. Okay. Three elements or three types of communications. And this is something that you'll hear if you ever take a college class on communications or if you just read books on it. There's an entire field of study devoted to the art of communication. Uh, so again, we're just going high level today. We're not going way, way into depth. Uh, but I've broken out three kind of major uh, forms of communication. So starting with verbal, and I gave a few examples as well. We've got spoken, which is like what I'm doing now. There's written, which would be like the word. There's tone, which could apply both to auditory tone, oh, voice inflections, uh, but it also could be the tone or, say, the genre of literature uh, that we're reading. 
Timbre, kind of the same thing. Um, Timbres, I, I stole this from a drum teacher back in music school. Uh, Timbres is kind of like thinking of all the different types of sounds and pitches that you can get out of a single instrument. So for example, one cymbal on a drum set, you can get probably six, seven, eight different sounds out of it because of where you're hitting it, you know, where you're hitting it on the stick, and it's pretty fascinating. So it's the same idea with, uh, with verbal uh, communications as well. Uh, inflection kind of touched on that, and then word choice even. Um, a lot of folks say, and I don't always hold up to this as well as maybe other people do, but they say generally you want to use words that pretty much anybody with at least a fifth grade education would recognize. Um, I try to mostly stick to that, but sometimes I have to throw in some Latin, you know, illocutionary. And <laughs> uh, I do apologize to folks sometimes if, I've, if I'm trying to think of a word to explain something and the only one that comes to mind is one of those $5, you know, six-syllable words. It's like, this is the right word, but now I have to explain what that word means. Sorry. <laughs> um, so word choice, it, it also goes into that verbal category. Uh, the second one is somatic, and this is one that may be a little bit less familiar uh, to folks, but this refers to the physical element or the physical types of communication. And I say in parentheses there, specifically separate from the conscious mind. Um, so an obvious one that I'm using a lot right now is gestures. And some of those are just to talk about big elements. And some of those are like last week when I used the illustration of a sword, you know, see so your gestures can involve a lot of different things. Uh, it also uh, includes expressions, so facial as well as vocal, uh, body language, eye contact, fidgeting. And by the way, this is something that uh, I don't think anybody in the room right now is uh, probably in this scenario, but if you're ever finding yourself in an interview and you're trying to put on a good you know, first impression, one of the things that uh, the interviewees often look for is how much you're fidgeting. Are you presenting yourself in a confident and calm demeanor or are you very nervous that you're here and you know doing all these touching your face and you know, folding your arms and doing all the, the weird things uh, it's amazing how much that stuff gets picked up on whether we have studied it or not so the other category and this is the one that's probably again more familiar is the nonverbals. i broke out somatic uh, elements because i think there's some uniqueness to it uh, but nonverbals also include all of the semantics. Uh, but it also includes things like observable decisions. So for example, if I watch somebody that says, I want to be debt free, but what I keep seeing them do is living paycheck to paycheck and they're never doing anything to increase their financial knowledge or savvy, I'm receiving a different communication from them about their actual priorities. Um, same thing with habits. I want to quit smoking. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it could also be good habits. You know, hey, I want to be in really good shape. Do I actually, is there, is there habits and actions backing it up? Are they exercising regularly? Are they, are they starting to think about what they're eating? Uh, priorities, disciplines, um, priorities. Oh, I want to know the Lord more. Okay, are you spending intentional time with him every day in his word and through prayer and through worship? Well, okay. I remember hearing a story from my Uncle Harv, who's a, Brilliant, wonderful man. Uh, passed away about 20 years ago, give or take. Um, my brother actually found an old cache of old messages that he had taught years and years, like 50, 60 years ago, back when he was working with the Navigators organization. And it's, it was really cool. It was like getting to know him in a totally different way, but over the span of all these decades, that was really, really cool. Um, but he shares this example of when he... Uh, him and a buddy were trying to get this publishing printing press uh, up and running off the ground for the Navigators organization. And by the way, Nav Press is still a thing today, so they did something right because it's still in existence. But he said, you know, these, these early weeks and months of trying to get it up and running, he was just there 16, 17 hours a day, just sometimes he'd even sleep there and wake up and immediately hit the ground running. And he said after a couple of months of this, he went to one of his buddies. He's like, man, I just... I wish I had more time to be in the word and his, and his buddy without even giving him a break. He's like, no, you don't. What do you mean? Yeah, I do. I mean, I'm spending 16 hour days working on it. I, I just wish I had more time to be in the word. No, you don't. So he said, kind of hurt him a little bit. And his buddy finally said, well, if it mattered to you that much, you would do it. 
you prioritize it. And I'm like, good grief, I don't have an excuse. <laughs> uh, so that would be an example of priorities. Uh, disciplines kind of goes hand in hand with it. There's things that maybe we don't want to do, but we know that they're going to move us in the direction that we want to go. And so we discipline ourselves to do it, to set these habits and these priorities. Um, same thing even with just routines, to be honest. Uh, routines would be things like I get up in the morning, I drink five cups of coffee, drive to the office listening to talk radio. It's, maybe there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe that's leading you where you want to go in life. Or maybe you say, oh, I feel really like jittery and I have heart palpitations all the time. And I'm always negative because I'm listening to talk radio. You know, even just routines that we do, maybe you, you mix it up, you do a different route to the office. Maybe you look at substitutions from coffee and you're, or you, you minimize it. So you're, you're reducing your caffeine intake. So even the routines can influence um, the ordering of our life, but it also influences the way that we communicate our routines and our priorities and our habits to others. And then just the last couple of ones here, uh, entertainment. I think that one's fairly obvious. Uh, associations, referrals, recommendations. Um, so this would be like groups that we're a part of, it would be associations or people that we know or related to, um, or especially those that we refer or recommend. And the one that came to my mind when I was putting that down was, hey, have you seen this movie? Or have you heard this band or ABC? Whether you intend it or not, you're, you're communicating some level of an endorsement on that movie or that song or whatever it is. Uh, and my goodness, that can play a role in how people perceive you in the future as well. All right, so we're going to look at what are some of the classical barriers to communication. And I did come up with a few little uh, examples from the scriptures because I think it's, it's useful. Uh, the first one is internal noise. And there's, I think I put three? Four because of gaps, yes. Uh, so internal noise. So this is going to be, now what, is, what are barriers to communication? Things that prevent us on the perlocutionary side from the message we're receiving, what prevents us from getting a more accurate picture of the illocutionary, the message that was originally intended. Um, so the first one is internal noise, what's going on in our minds, inside of our own heads. Uh, that can be beliefs. Uh, for a lot of human history, a lot of folks thought that the world was flat, so they didn't want to explore because they're afraid they'd fall off the edge of the world. <laughs> and then eventually somebody was brave enough and said, no, I think it's round. Oh, okay, all of a sudden you can explore the rest of the world here. It's amazing. Uh, values. Um, maybe I value family. And when somebody comes in with, oh, you just got to spend more time at the office, man, if you want to get ahead in life and in your career, well... Okay, maybe I'm not going to receive that the same way they intended it because it's conflicting with the value that I've got. Assumptions. This is a big one. Uh, this is probably the most obvious one, too, on the whole list. Um, well, I heard somebody once upon a time said it, so I'm just assuming they're right before really going and, like, fact-checking it, doing the background on it. And then defensiveness, which is another one that we see, unfortunately, a little bit more prevalent in our modern culture and I'm only going to say it. I'm not going to touch in onto it much more, but we'll just say politics. I think you'll see defensiveness there. <laughs> um, hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. The way that like my values, my beliefs, my assumptions, or if I'm defensive about a particular subject or topic, that a hundred percent influences the way that I communicate to others as well. Absolutely. Um, I thought of a few examples uh, in the New Testament where some of these come into play. And the first one that jumped up to my mind was in John chapter 4, where Jesus is interfacing with the Samaritan woman at the well. And there's just a hilarious dialogue that goes on between these two. And, and you know, her first thing is like, oh, well, why are you a Jew talking to me, a Samaritan? Oh, yeah, also, you're a guy, I'm a girl. That's like a cultural no-no. This, like, these beliefs or these values, assumptions that she had is that we don't interact. Why are we interacting? And then Jesus is, like, trying to give her truth, and she's just like, well, you know, there, this mountain over here is where we worship, and you guys say this. <laughs> you know, so she's got, the, again, these beliefs. Uh, well, okay, at the end of it, we know that, that Messiah is going to come, and he's going to explain everything to us. So, again, she has all these assumptions and beliefs that... It's somewhere out there, 
but it's not right now and right here present talking with her over a well. <laughs> and so Jesus is like, that's me. Whoa, you know, mind blowing experience. Uh, so I love that one. I also thought about uh, John uh, chapter 11 and specifically verse 24. So this is when, uh, when Lazarus dies and Mary and Martha call for Jesus to come and, and he comes out and before he even gets all the way there, Martha runs out and meets him and says, wow, why, did, why weren't you here? If you were here, you could have spared him from dying. And, you know, she's got a lot of these assumptions about how miracles can work. And, okay, well, if they're still alive, maybe the miracle is more likely, but, you know, well, now that he's dead, that sucks. And, and Jesus is like, well, there's, you know, the resurrection. She's like, well, I know at the end of the age, there's the resurrection. He's like, no, I am the resurrection. So I thought that was another good example of the internal noise muddled up the communication. Um, and what I like about those first two examples is in both cases, Jesus is the one that's communicating. And you would think, good grief, if anybody could be the perfect communicator in life, it would be him. <laughs> and yet all these people are still like, I don't understand what he's talking about. <laughs> I almost wrote down the one where... Uh, Come on in, Sean. Good to have you. You know, what's that mean? <laughs> yeah, what's that mean? Like, oh, did somebody give him bread when we weren't looking? Did Jesus go into town and get some Chick-fil-A? He's just like, my food is to do the word and the will of the Lord. They're like, what's that mean? <laughs> which was great. And then the other one I wrote down was, uh, it was in Acts 11, which is when Peter is giving, getting this vision um, because up to this point, he had considered himself, I was about to say he had been, but I'm like, he'd considered himself as more accurate, uh, to be a very good Jewish person, you know, very, um, very devout in his practices and principles. He didn't eat things that were unclean. He didn't touch things that were unclean. He would, for the most part, go to the temple and do what he was supposed to do. So he viewed himself as being very upright. And this was even after Pentecost. This was during the spread of the gospel. And in this vision, um, the angel of the Lord comes down and says, basically shows him a bunch of unclean animals in this vision and says, okay, go ahead and eat it. And Peter resists. He's like, no, I can't because I've never soiled myself with such things. And the angel of the Lord says, what God has considered clean, you can no longer consider unclean. And of course, this was all meant to be a direct representation of the way that Peter and the church in Jerusalem in general had viewed the Gentiles. They were like, well, they're all unclean, and so we want to keep our distance from them. It's okay. Paul kind of like broke out. He's doing something, which is cool, but good for him. But the rest of us, and the angel Lord saying, no, you too. And of course, the rest of that chapter, the good news is he follows the leading, and he meets up with Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion, who was uh, given actually quite a, a generous and a very, sort of want to use, favorable description uh, says that he was already a righteous man, very devout uh, in everything he had done. And so he also had had a vision about trying to find this guy named Peter, Cephas, and, and to invite him to the house so that he could actually hear the, the gospel be preached to him in person. And he does, and the whole house becomes saved because of it, which is a really, really wonderful thing. <laughs> um, so that's internal noise, things that can prevent us from receiving the communication properly. Uh, the second one, this is maybe the more obvious one, is external noise. So things that are outside of ourselves. Um, the first one would be sounds, like I'm hearing some birds right now. There's occasionally the road traffic. Um, I think about it on like, you know, if we're doing worship on a Sunday morning, if the sound system cuts out, okay, that's distracting. Or if a microphone cuts out during the message, okay, something's interfering with uh, my ability to receive the message the way it was intended. Uh, hustle and bustle. So that could be like, hey, I'm just, I'm moving, I'm living a rapid paced life. I'm not slowing down long enough to hear what God wants to speak to me through the word or what a person wants to speak to me about their life. Uh, phone interference. I'm on a phone call and the signal drops. <laughs> it brings me back. I guess it's been a few years now, but uh, who was at Verizon? I think for a long time they had those, can you hear me now? Yeah. Commercials going all around the world. Can you hear me now? Uh, and then uh, because we are in the modern era, Another one that can influence is an unstable internet connection. I'm trying to do a uh, Zoom meeting. I was about to say a Rike meeting. That's not it. A Zoom meeting, or I'm trying to send an email, or whatever. And if I don't have a stable internet connection, 
maybe some of the message goes through, maybe some of it doesn't. Or if you're like anybody in the world that's ever used a text message and you're typing something and it auto corrects it to the wrong word and you send it through, you're like, well, that's not what I meant to say. And there's another external noise example of things that can influence uh, or get in the way of the communication. Um, number three, semantic noise. Um, this is one of the ones that I use maybe more often than I should, which is that the receiver doesn't understand a word or a gesture given. And again, I try to, as much as possible, explain, if I feel like I'm using a $5 word, I try to explain what it means. Uh, but sometimes I'll use what I think is a 50 cent word and it's possible somebody still doesn't get it. Or vice versa, somebody else uses a word and I'm like, what in the world is that? Um, one of the... Um, one of the audiobooks I was listening to, authors are really good at using fancy words <laughs> where I'm like, I'm going to pull my dictionary out, figure out what this is. And uh, what was the one I came up with recently? Portents. Somebody's like, yeah, dark portents. I'm like, dark portents, what are those? So I looked it up. Apparently it means a portent is basically an omen. So in the story, there were these dark omens that were showing up. Oh, there you go. If nothing else, you learned another word. <laughs> but... Yeah, that was when I heard it. I'm like, what are they talking about? Um, a second one, idioms or colloquialisms, like figures of speech that are maybe cultural or maybe set in time. And we have a lot of examples of them now. Like, hey, can you give me a hand? Somebody reading that 2,000 years ago might have been like, you're taking off your hand to give it to them? But what is happening? What, what, are you, what do you mean? Uh, or second language. Really language yeah. yeah. That's a great example. Yeah, second language learners, 100%. Um, and I actually did look up a couple of examples because there's a lot of idioms and colloquialisms within ancient Judaism as well. Um, it was funny, I was looking at the list. I looked at probably like 12, 15 of them. And I, th I think about... Well, actually, I think all of them I had heard enough times just growing up in the church and reading the scriptures that I actually kind of knew what they already meant. But it was, it was funny going down the list. I'm like, oh, these might be confusing to some people, like especially if it's their first time ever reading it. They're like, what do you mean? So a couple of examples I used was um, breaking of bread. That one actually is culturally kind of integrated as well. But when we say let's break bread together, it means let's have a meal together. But it's interesting when you think about it, like, from a strictly literal perspective, somebody just like breaking a piece of bread, you're like, what? I don't get it. <laughs> um, another one I thought of was actually in John chapter six, uh, verse 54. And this one, this was probably a better example for ones that might sound weird to us today. Uh, but Jesus is responding to the crowd and he says, whoever eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood has eternal life. And we read that, we're like, what? <laughs> is that like cannibalism? What are we supposed to do? Uh, but that would have been one of their colloquialisms, one of their idioms as well. And it basically means that whoever receives and understands and then applies the teaching that Jesus was giving them, then they have the eternal life. So these were expressions that the people of their day would have known kind of the same way that we understand, hey, give me a hand, uh, our own idioms and expressions. Uh, but that is another thing that can get in the noise, the semantic noise uh, in a communication. And then the third one I put in there is acronyms. Fortunately, you don't see too many of those in the scriptures, uh, but I think we see a lot of those today. And I'm guilty. I'm a recovering, you know, uh, army vet. And everything in the military becomes an acronym if it's not already. And a lot of the times it's not even shorter than the original word. <laughs> and you're just like, but why? Why do we need 300 different acronyms to try to memorize? Um, I've gotten pretty good at not using almost any of those anymore. Uh, but once in a while, if I'm talking with somebody else that was in the military, a few of them slip out and then I have to catch myself. Uh, anybody else in the room is gonna be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, so those are the first three. And then the fourth one, uh, the fourth, I almost wanna call it noise, but it's a little different. Um, but it's this concept of gaps. And gaps are distinctions that cause unrelatability. And so I put in quite a few uh, examples in there. Um, so it makes the communication difficult because of maybe a gap in age. Hey, I just can't really relate to you because you're really young, you're really old, et cetera. Uh, gender, I think that's a pretty obvious one. Uh, ethnicity, race, 
um, where you're from, maybe the way that you've grown up, there's going to be certain disconnects or different gaps um, where words don't necessarily always mean the same thing to me as it does to them. Um, culture, that was a good one too. Uh, I can't remember the specific culture, but I remember hearing at one point uh, that there's a culture or maybe a few around the world where if we, use, for us, we use a thumbs up as like, hey, it's a good thing. Like, how's it going? Yeah, it's good. In certain cultures, that would be kind of the equivalent of like flipping them the middle finger. And they're like, whoa, what did I do to you? You know? <laughs> so, you know, the cultural gap can cause uh, issues with the communication status. Um, I don't think I've ever personally had an issue with this one, but for some folks, you know, maybe interfacing with a celebrity could cause a gap in the communication. I just can't really relate to what they're trying to say or, or they can't relate to what I'm trying to say. Uh, but also our personal experiences, that's a big one we can all relate to. Um, somebody who's been skydiving and wants to talk about it and reminisce about it, there's always gonna be a gap from somebody who's not ever done it because there's the different experience there. Um, and then I put in a few uh, generations there. Uh, some of the classic ones. Okay, so those are some of the obvious uh, noises, some of the gaps, some of the things that disrupt communication. But there's good news because we're going to give you a partial solution. <laughs> uh, the very first one is awareness. And I basically ripped this right off of, uh, who was it, uh, AA. Their first thing is, you know, acknowledge that there's a problem or admit what's going on. So the first step is awareness, realizing that many communications are more than just one dimensional and that they have multiple layers of meaning. Realizing that we all have our own lens, our own worldview uh, that shapes our illocutions, the way that we communicate to others, but also perlocutions, the things that we receive and the messages that we understand. And then realizing the potential barriers, which are many of them are the ones that we just went over on this list as well. And there's others, but again, we're trying to get a, a good starting point. Uh, so that's, I think is a good starting point. The second one, a commitment to intentionality. With any worthwhile communication, we can commit ourselves to digging deeper. This can involve intentional study, contemplation, or in some cases, clarifying dialogue. And this is also a greater time commitment. And I think that's one of the overarching high-level keys and takeaways that I would want to mention about effective communication, whether we're applying it to the way we relate to people or the way that we relate to the scriptures, um, to understand communication better and to do it more effectively with others is going to take more time. So it is harder, which I think is one of the reasons a lot of people don't put in the effort to it. Uh, but it can be done. Uh, number three, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Ooh, that almost sounds like scripture. <laughs> and then I put a slash there for communicate because, again, communication is a lot more... Uh, large of a concept than, than just speaking. Um, so being quick to listen, slow to speak, we are seldom, or excuse me, we seldom regret listening quickly, but we often regret speaking too quickly. <laughs> At least in our family, that's true. Listening not only helps us to receive the communication more accurately, it also communicates our value for receiving communication accurately. And this is communicated to ourselves as well as to others. Um, there's a concept that everybody's probably heard of at this point of active listening. And active listening is, it's kind of this image of like you're leaning forward in your chair, you're taking notes, you're, you're acknowledging what's said, you're, and maybe you're even asking clarifying questions. You're kind of interfacing in this way that says, I value you, but I also value trying to understand this communication. Versus what I would call as passive listening is, you're slouched back, maybe your arms are folded, maybe you're looking at them, maybe you're kind of looking around the room, you look very disinterested, maybe you're paying attention, maybe you're not. So you're kind of, you're in the room, your ears are picking up the sound waves, but your mind isn't necessarily internalizing it. Be an active listener, not a passive, there we go. <laughs> and then number four, ask for the Holy Spirit's help. I would say in terms of priority, feel free to do that one first. Um, but I put it as the fourth one because it just felt good in the list. <laughs> uh, even when we are aware, even when we are intentional and we're focused, it's still possible that we can fall victim to miscommunication. The Holy Spirit can help to guide our thoughts and our communications, 
and is happy to do so when we ask. And of course, there's a lot of passages that we're familiar with, with uh, you have not because you ask not. But if two or more are in agreement about what they request, the Holy Spirit is happy to do it or to give us the desires of our heart, which I always love that passage because not only is it God agreeing to give us what we ask for, but he's also giving us an internal desire in the first place. And it's easy to identify if something is a a God-given desire versus it comes from somewhere else uh, because God-given desires tend to line up with what we see in Scripture. Is it drawing us closer to him? Is it drawing us closer to people in harmony and in building up one another? Or is it leading us towards separation and division from others? Is it leading us towards destruction? Um, Okay, well, then those ones probably aren't coming from God uh, or his word as well. But asking the Holy Spirit's help because he is faithful and good uh, to give to those who ask. All right, so that's our high-level overview on communication and how it applies to the scriptures, how to read and understand the Bible. I will give us two options here. We can either... Uh, do some questions. If there's any questions, we can touch on those. Um, or if there's none, and if we're interested, we have about 10 minutes left. We could uh, do a quick overview on where we left off last week. <laughs> but I'll leave it to y'all if there's a preference. I have one quick yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. You know about it? Yeah, so I've actually, I started out quite a few years ago. I finally decided, okay, I'm going to do a chronological read through the Bible. And so I, I started it. I got through the Old Testament chronologically, which is really cool. It did, by the way, it put everything into a much better perspective. <laughs> but I think it made, it put it into a better perspective because I had already read it several times, you know, just by page, cover to cover. So kind of understanding these things, the chronological, the chronology of it uh, really helped for me to set the pieces in the right order. And then it it made a lot of connections like, oh, well, this prophet would have been a contemporary of Ezekiel. Oh, this guy would have been living around the same time as Elijah. And all of a sudden it bridges all of the Old Testament together in a way that makes sense rather than just feeling like jumping all over the place, like a scatter plot, if you will. So for me, I found it really helpful. Um, I started doing the same in the New Testament, but once I hit the New Testament, I decided to also make it a really deep dive. Um, so doing a chronological study of the New Testament, and I've been on that for about four years, and I'm about three quarters of the way through the Gospels. <laughs> so it's going to be a while before I get all the way through the rest of the New Testament. Um, but there is, even with what I've gone through so far, there's been a really interesting correlation of what was Jesus's earthly ministry and what things happened kind of in conjunction through the different gospel accounts, which is really fascinating. So I recommend it to anybody that's interested. (laughs) Did that? Yes, that's perfect. Any other questions? I think what you're suggesting is is that whatever mode you're doing the service, preparing for a quiet time or doing the study, that you're, you're, you have some awareness over these issues mm-hmm. to help increase the understanding of the Bible, that yeah. these are impediments, and identifying the impediments is half of that. Is that pretty much what you're... Yeah, that's... Whether they be auditory yeah. or will sound or whatever they look like, is identifying those impediments, yeah. moving them to the degree that you can to help... Mm-hmm. Maybe increase your awareness of what the message is. Absolutely. And, that's, and that does tie into a little bit of uh, what we'll dive into next week, which next week is going to be a lot of understanding our starting point. And in a very simplistic terms, I'm going to say we're kind of looking at our own worldview lens. Like, how is it that we see the world currently? And how does that impact the way that we communicate? Or how does that impact the way that we approach the scriptures? Um, so being aware of even that, just being aware of our own personal lens, our own worldview or, or whatever else, our biases, our experiences, uh, is going to help us when we get into a communication situation uh, for a lot of obvious reasons. You know, part of that is, hey, I might know that anytime we start talking about ABC, 
my mind immediately gets defensive because I had this experience as a kid and, hey, you talk about God as a loving father. Well, I didn't have that or whatever the case may be. Or, hey, um, be faithful in your, in your giving and be generous. And somebody might reject that and say, well, you know, I've never had more than the bare necessities to scrape on in life. So I, I kind of resist that message. Or anything, the way that we, we approach our work ethic, for example. A lot of the Proverbs talk about being diligent in our work. And somebody might be in a horrible job. And what they read in the scripture basically is telling them to stick it out and, you know, get better. And they're saying like, but I don't like my job. And they may genuinely be in a bad spot to where they need to get out of it and get into something that's a better fit. Um, But those are all things where our experiences can influence it. Uh, And again, can be an impediment, can be a distraction. But I also like the word noise specifically uh, because noise, we can be aware of different sounds or different noises, but we can learn how to hear what we're intending to listen to. Uh, So a simple example would be, and this isn't a great example, uh, but I think of like any or most mothers when they have a new child, they learn to recognize the sound of their own child's cry. Uh, Even if there's 20 other children crying, they can kind of pick it out in that that noise. I don't know if that... Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think that that fourth one on the list there, asking the Holy Spirit to help. Um, I never want to limit what God can do, which ironically is one of the lines from a song we're going to be doing this morning. (laughs) Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Uh, It's going to sound better when we do it in there. (laughs) Um, But I will say, at least in my own experience, it seems like more often than not, when I'm able to pray more specifically, uh, when there's clarity in, in my own mind about the purpose, and, and this can be really any part of prayer. It could be in my adoring God or, or giving thanks to him and exalting him. It could be in uh, thanksgiving. It can be in confession. But it can also be in our supplications and in our, in our requests. Um, I think when I'm more specific in my requests, I tend to see more specific answers uh, to the prayers versus the very general vague ones. I generally get general and vague responses or answers to it. Uh, and, and so that's where kind of tying those, fusing those two elements together is, okay, now I'm aware of maybe this running white noise that's in the back of my head. I can acknowledge that it's there. Holy Spirit, can you help me rein that in or maybe soften it a bit for a season or for a moment here whilst I'm focusing intently on your word or if I'm focusing on prayer or just being present in the moment. Um, I'm not going to guarantee it, but I would imagine, you know, that being more specific in the prayer would, would potentially help see a more specific answer. My own two cents. Yeah, it's interesting. I I don't know when we would ever touch on it, maybe in a future class at some point. Um, But I had done this uh, discipleship program with quite a few fellows. And one of the things that I took them through was uh, this concept of health or the resource of our health. And we we went through, of course, the obvious, the physical side. um, But we also went through both mental health and spiritual health. And I used a lot of similar metaphors that we can pull from physical health and then tried to apply them to each of these other avenues. And, you know, some of that was like, okay, well, we know what it means to be, to have physical strength endurance or 
physical cardio endurance. Now, how would that look like to have spiritual cardio strength or physical cardio endurance? And the same way that we build our physical muscles in a lot of regards is the same way that we build spiritual and mental muscles is intentional discipline and routine and, and repetition. And uh, If you want to get into the neurology of it, the, the way that the brain is formed, uh, the neural pathways are formed through the things, the habits that are repeated the most often. And the benefit of that, the reason, as far as I understand, that the brain works like that is to create what's called schemas. And schemas are basically shortcuts in reasoning or logic that allows us to arrive at a conclusion in a millisecond versus having to think and process through each unique step of it every single time we're uh, just or not justified, whatever, in that situation. Uh, one of the classic examples is if imagine you met somebody who had never in their life seen or heard of a cantaloupe. And there's a lot of ways you could try to describe it, but one simple way you might be, uh, you might say, well, it's, it's, a fruit, it's a round fruit, sort of looks like a big orange. You know, that's not exactly it, but it kind of gives you this, oh, okay, there's something I can pull from. There's this schema that gives me a starting point that's at least reasonably close to what it is. Um, and that's a lot of how the neural pathways are formed is to help you to make these quick connections, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, depending on what, uh, what neural pathways we're forming. Um, but yeah, we can intentionally uh, choose the ones that we want to set, and a lot of folks don't. Uh, it's, oh, there's a quote I was going to use. I could almost remember it. Um, oh, it's just off the outside. It's something to the effect of, you can choose your, everybody's intentionally choosing the habits of their life. Just some of them are more aware of it than others. <laughs> Something to that effect. <laughs> um, great questions, great questions. Uh, well, let's go ahead and wrap up in prayer. And then if we have any other questions, we can talk about them as we head back on over to, uh, to the sanctuary. Uh, Lord, thank you again so much for today, for everybody in this room. Uh, thank you again for the gift of your word for the sword of the spirit. And I thank you that you have given us the capacity and the access to uh, the tools that it takes to become proficient swords people, wielding the sword of the spirit. So Lord, may we be good stewards of that. And for the rest of this morning, I just lift up to you the worship ceremony, uh, service together. Lord, may we be honoring to you, edifying to one another, and ultimately, uh, to go out from this place today and be a blessing to the rest of the world. Pray these things in your name. Amen.